Hello, 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 everyone, and welcome to the fabulous Friday broadcast of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. So glad that you can be here with me, with us, with the whole Miss Hope's Reading Hour fam on this fabulous Friday evening. Happy Black History Month for the last time this month. But as we all know, Black History, as they say, is 365, 66 on a leap year, okay? Black History is every day because there's African Americans that are making history, Africans that are making history, Afro Latinos that are making history, people who are of African descent all over the world making history. So, and they're doing it every day in small ways, in huge ways. So we have February here in the United States where we celebrate Black History Month, but we know it's bigger than a month. It's bigger than that. So just for this month, We'll be saying happy Black History Month for the last time because come Monday, guess what? It is March the 1st. Time is moving, friends. It's moving, okay? Um, so hopefully you had a very thankful Thursday. You found something to be thankful for and that so far that you are Friday has been fabulous. Um, of course, as you know, here in Philadelphia, the young ones who are in public school, they get a half day every Friday. So, of course, that was definitely fabulous for them. The young ones get a half day, not us. We still have to do trainings and things like that. But you know, it's like we're just paying attention to our classes that we have to take and things. And it's still pretty fabulous. It's still pretty nice, okay? Because we get a little break from having to teach and stuff. But we um, we still get work done. We still learn a lot of things. Today, my class, um, we watched um, most of Hidden Figures today. If you have not seen that movie, it is a very good movie about three amazing African-American women who made great, um, oh, excuse me, something in my throat, who made great contributions to our space program here in the United States. Um, and it is an awesome story. If you want something to watch with your young ladies, even with your gentlemen, okay? If you want a great Black History Month movie to watch with the family, Hidden Figures is definitely a great movie to watch. And it's good that I brought that up because what I found out is that March is Women's History Month. So... Um, the ladies from Hidden Figures may come back again during Women's History Month, which starts on Monday, okay? So my friends, hopefully you have great plans for the weekend. I know here in the tri-state area, it's going to be kind of rainy in some places further north of Pennsylvania. It will be um, in further north of Philadelphia, it'll be a little slushy rain. So um, hopefully you have some cool things to do inside. But next week, I believe that there's going to be a few days where there's going to be a bit of a warm up. So if there is sun and there is warmth, make sure that you get outside, get some of that vitamin D on your skin, get some fresh air, run around in some grass or something like that. OK, now, my friends, before we go any further, you know what I got to do? Got to do it every time, okay? Because we want Miss Hope's Reading Hour to stay on, right? So, the wonderful music that you hear and the great books that we read, unfortunately, Miss Hope and Miss Hope's Reading Hour do not own the rights to any of them. But guess what they're here for? 
your listening and reading enjoyment. That's exactly what they're here for. So um, we have three great books today. If you saw the teaser, we are talking about writers today. Two great African-American writers, storytellers, poets. Um, since we're doing the reading hour, of course we had to talk about two wonderful writers today. And also in homage to our last broadcast of this love month, if you notice I'm wearing my heart earrings and my heart necklace, we have um, a book that will celebrate love, but in a different way. And you will see when I show you the books. Now, my friends, let us get to the books, shall we? Let's get to the books, show you what we're going to be reading. Oh, my goodness. And so, and these books have awesome pictures in them, okay? Now, remember, there is no chapter book today because I put it up in the Facebook group. I have to put it up in the Instagram group. I'm so sorry, Instagram. There are several Miss Hope's reading hours that I have to go ahead and post that I have not posted yet. I was, of course, you remember I was having the tummy troubles, so I really didn't get around to posting them. I will, and I will put um, the poll on the Instagram group so that you all can have a chance to also vote for our next chapter book. Those of you on Periscope and on YouTube, you can put in the comments um, if you watch live or if you watch later, you can put in the comments which book you would prefer for our next chapter book. You will have until Monday at 5 p.m. to vote because by then... It's going to be time for us to start that new book, okay? So I need you to vote. Please go on, click which one that you like. Vote, 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 okay? Now, for our books, let me share them with you. Our first book is called Feed Your Mind, a story of August Wilson. Feed Your Mind. Look at that awesome cover. Isn't that cool? Feed Your Mind, a story of August Wilson by um, Cybert Medal winner Jen Bryant, illustrated by Canada Chapman. This book is a medal winner. Well, the author is a medal winner. Feed Your Mind, a story of August Wilson. All right, our next book. Oh my goodness, I, I I saw the cover and I was like, I already love this book because I know the pictures inside are gorgeous. This book is called A Song for Gwendolyn Brooks. The author is Elise Faye Duncan, illustrated by Zia Gordon. A Song for Gwendolyn Brooks. Look at that picture, isn't it beautiful? So we will be reading that today. Also, remember I just told you that our last book is about love. Now, if we have time, there was a fourth book I wanted to read. If we have time, I will read it. If not, we'll save it for another time. But this book talks about love, but it talks about loving our color and whatever color we are. So this book is called The Colors of Us. Look at all those beautiful young ladies in that picture. The Colors of Us. This book is by Karen Katz. The Colors of Us. That will be our third book. The fourth book will be a surprise if we have time for it, okay? All right, so let us get to our first book, Feed Your Mind, A Story of August Wilson by Jen Bryant. This book also has a dust jacket. It doesn't look the same as the cover, 
but I still like the way it looks. I'll let you see it in a moment. Look at that. All those different things on the front cover. Oh, and then on the back cover, look at that cake made of books. Isn't that cool? All right, let us get into Feed Your Mind, a story of August Wilson. Act One. They call it Little Harlem, the city within a city. A mile east of downtown, it is a mishmash, a melting pot of workers and their kin. Syrians, Africans, Poles, and Jews, Irish, Haitians, Germans, and Italians, their row homes, apartments, shacks, jam-packed between sloping streets. On April 27th, 1947, in a tiny apartment behind Bella's Market, Frederick August Kittle Jr. is born. Named for his father, a white German baker who sometimes visits with bread in his hand, but mostly is not around. Now, Freddie walks down Wiley Avenue with his mother, Daisy Wilson, past barbers, butcher shops, bakeries, where people speak Italian, Hebrew, or Greek. Their unique voices blending like an orchestra, their smells, corned beef, lamb, okra, fettuccine, making, small, making his small mouth water. Summer nights in the backyard, Daisy plays card games with the neighbors as someone strums a guitar, their laughter drifting over children playing dodgeball and stickball, loading the bases. Freddie plays, but he's an observer too, always watching and listening. When night falls and the children are called inside, he notices how most of them have a mother and a father to tuck them in, but not Freddie. Instead, with just a sixth grade education and a job cleaning other people's homes, Daisy reads to him at night, filling him up with stories, words, and hope. If you can read, you can do anything. You can be anything. That is the absolute truth. Breaking the code. Loops and lines in long, neat rows. But what do they mean? Mother reads. She knows. He likes to turn the pages, feel the lightness of the paper. Look here, Freddie, she says, pointing to labels. His eyes follow her finger to the shelf, his mouth sounding them out. Soup, tomato, rice, beans. He is smart, curious. He is four. One morning on the way out the door, he spies sister's school book open on the floor. The sun's light brings the leaves out and suddenly the loops and lines begin to mean. Each day after, he practices textbooks, newspapers, street signs, clothing labels, drinking the words in faster and faster. By the time he turns five, he even reads breakfast. Golden yellow and ready to spread, parquet. That's the kind of margarine. Strawberry jam, Smucker Company, the brand you can trust. Post's Great Nuts Flakes, it's Hopalong Cassidy's favorite whole wheat cereal. Mom stops her washing. She looks at the table, then back at her word loving son. Get your coat, Freddie. We're going out. Wiley Avenue Branch, Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh. Tall walls, big windows, people sitting at long tables whispering. Rows and rows and rows of shelves. One moment, please, says the blue sweater behind the counter. Mom squeezes his hand. I'll wait. 
You go on and pick out a book. Running over to the shelves, his fingers glide along the cool spines. He slides one out, bringing it to mother, who shows him a small card printed with his name. This means you can borrow any book in this room. Is that the one you want? It is. Later, his eyes move across the page, following each line into a bright new world. When it rains, it pours. Morton Salt, mother cries out her answer to the radio game. Name the product that uses this slogan and you win a brand new washing machine. A dime hurried into his sister's hand. Sister running down to the payphone on the corner, calling the number, shouting into the receiver, Morton Salt, a voice on the other end. Please stay on the line so we can get your name. Jumping joy and jubilation. No more scrub board for mother. No more bleeding, peeling hands. His sister tries to stay calm, saying the family name and address. Where, miss? Say it again. She repeats and click, swift as an electric switch. The new machine vanishes. Instead, the man says, you get a certificate to the Salvation Army. They have some used ones there. The slow shuffle walk home. His sister thinks on how to soften the news. But mother, isn't that better than nothing? Better than having your back and wrists sore? Your hands bleeding? At least you won't be scrubbing no more. Mother stirs soup, her silent rage rising with the steam. Tell them I said no. They can keep their used machine. Relocation. For 12 years, Freddie has known only these two rooms and an outhouse in back as home. Now the city's building a new civic center right smack in the lower hill so the kittles move to Hazelwood. Bigger place, nicer place. Indoor plumbing, Polish, Irish, Slovak, Hungarian, Italian. Most of the neighbors work in the steel mill. Most are kind, welcoming. Most, but not all. Crash comes a brick through the window. The note attached says, nigger, stay out. Is Daisy afraid? Ha! It'll take a lot more than a brick and some scribbling to make her shake. The next day, the newspaper prints a story of the brick flying through their window. Daisy reads that paper, then wraps it around the note and the brick and throws it out back in the trash. Detour. At 14, he reads everything, the family Bible minus the begats, his sister's Hardy Boys books, his other sister's Nancy Drew's magazines, newspapers, sometimes even an owner's manual or two. He reads history books with battle maps and the letters of Emperor Napoleon. He reads about athletes, the boxer Floyd Patterson and Pittsburgh's Negro League baseball teams, the Crawfords and the Grays, and whose players grew up playing stickball, whose players grew up playing stickball on the Hill District streets. One day, on the way home from the park, he detours, bouncing his basketball to the door of the Hazelwood Library. Inside, he finds 30 or 40 titles lined up on a shelf labeled Negro Books. He mouths the names on the spines, Hughes, Dunbar, Ellison, Wright. The basketball becomes a chair, the Dunbar book open on his lap. Be proud, my race, in mind and soul. Thy name is writ on glory scroll in characters of fire. The words make his heart skip. Freddy reads right through supper. As all around him, the world shifts. The 
universe opens wide. He's falling in love with books. Schooled. Good grades get Freddie in. He is the only black student in ninth grade at Central Catholic High School. Brother Dominic teaches English. That is good, Brother D tells Freddie, handing back his homework. You could be a writer. Meanwhile, each morning, there is an unsigned note on Freddie's desk. Go home, nigger. Meanwhile, each day at recess, someone pushes him, stomps on his feet, picks a fight. Freddie Kittles is big, 175 pounds of frustration and anger, but still just one against the rest. Most afternoons, he finds 40 white kids waiting outside, daring him to try to walk by. Sometimes it is so bad that the principal put Freddie, puts Freddie in a cab and sends him home. Freddie thinks, it's only ninth grade, three more years. Who can live like this? I quit, he tells the principal. Please don't, the principal says. I quit, he tells Brother Dominic. Please stay, says Brother D. But when the principal goes back to his office and Brother D goes back to his class, Freddie just walks out. Wow, that has had to be hard. Now what? Her mouth is set hard, hands pounding on flour and lard. You're smart, Freddy. Now what? He shrugs, tries to read a book. She pounds harder on the dough. Well, if you're not going to be a lawyer, then go and learn how to fix cars or something. But at Connolly Trade School, all the auto classes are full. Well, Sheet metal then, tin cups and all kinds of metal stuff, Draw mechanical drawing class plus English, history, and math. But wait a minute, these are fourth grade books. Some kids are 15 and can't read. This is my education? This isn't working out, he tells mother. She shakes her head, points across the street to Gladstone Public High last chance. He, so he goes, sits in the back, indifferent, frustrated, more of the same, he thinks. Black and white kids, black and white kids may share the room, may share the room, but the blacks are still second class. The name calling, the fights, the stares, the same here as everywhere. He daydreams of Sonny Liston, the black boxer who knocks out every white guy he fights. Then a miracle in history class. Write a paper on someone from the past to admire. Freddie's eager to show what he knows. For a week, he spends after school hours at the library, reading, taking notes, and writing Napoleon's Will to Power. He binds the pages, hands it in, feeling like maybe, just maybe, this new school might be okay after all. Prove it. Teacher, you wrote this paper on Napoleon? Freddy, yes. Teacher, the whole thing? Freddy, yes. Teacher, flipping through pages. All 20 pages, all by yourself? Freddy, yes. Teacher, you didn't copy it straight from a book? Freddie, no, I told you I wrote it. Teacher, flipping through more pages than pointing. This part right here, where it talks about the battle, your older sister didn't write that? Freddie, looking at the passage. No, I wrote it all by myself. Those are my thoughts. Teacher, points at letter A and letter E at the top of the first page. I'm going to give you one of these two grades. You need to prove to me somehow that you wrote this paper. Freddie, frustrated. I told you I wrote it. My footnotes and my sources are right there. Right there. I don't have to do more than that. Teacher is silent, thinking, picking up pen and circles E for failure on the paper. Hands it to Freddie. 
Freddie is disgusted, angry, trembling, rips up the paper and jams it in the wastebasket, storms out the room and out of the school. Wow. In high school, you're doing footnotes and you think you cheated? Come on. Act two, Rose. Like every other morning, he wakes, dresses, eats. He doesn't mention he's quit school again. Like every other morning, he leaves the house, walks to the corner and across the street. But this morning, his feet kept going north toward Oakland. I dropped out of school, but I didn't drop out of life. Many blocks later, he arrives at the main branch of the Carnegie Public Library. If you can read, you can do anything. That's what mother, who had quit school to work the crop rows with her mother said. Now, walking through these rows, Freddie feels the weight of that story. He turns the corner and there, Hughes, Dunbar, Ellison, Wright, books by black writers he found by chance back at the Hazelwood branch. And there are more. W.E.B. Du Bois, Arna Botemps, James Baldwin, Booker T. Washington, a mother load of black literature, a treasure he's aching to explore. Inside Ellison's Invisible Man, he reads, I always try to go in everyone's way but my own. I have also been called one thing and then another, while no one really wished to hear what I called myself. Yes, yes, Freddie whispers back to the book. He reads the words again, slips off his shoes, lets the last line lodge deep in his mind, a tool he will someday pull out again and use. Feed your mind. Weekdays, he stays in Oakland till the school kids go home. Mother doesn't know where he goes, or if she does, she doesn't say. All morning and half the afternoon, he reads those books by black writers, but he also reads about photography, history, art, cooking, baseball, and antique cars. He reads about religion, science, and philosophy. He reads pages of the dictionary and the World Book Encyclopedia, the United States Constitution, and the Emancipation Proclamation. He reads with delight and with a fearsome hunger, like a guest at a royal feast. The table is so wide, so vast, all he can do is try to taste a bit of everything. That is a lot of reading. What's in a name? Four years later, he sits at a different table, weighing an offer. I'll pay you $20. That's what his sister Frida, away at Fordham University, promised if he would write her term paper comparing two poems, two poets, Robert Frost and Carl Sandburg. Frida knows he reads poetry. She knows Freddie writes his own poems too, but no one has ever paid him to write. So he stays up half the night getting every sentence just right. Frida pays in cash, $20, $20. Next day, he takes all of it downtown, buys a used typewriter he, he's seen in a store window. No money left for the bus. He lugs the heavy machine uptown block after block after block. Back in the basement apartment he shares with some artist friends, he sets it down, runs his finger over fingers over the keys, twists in a single sheet of paper. He sits back and lets the past few years wash over him. Father's death, sisters grown up, gone off, the city of Pittsburgh evicting half of the hill to build some civic center, mother's fury at his quitting school, joining the army, but then quitting that too, his failing in love with a Bessie Smith record, and the rhythm and lyrics of the blues, his string of jobs as gardener, dishwasher, cook, 
his constant reading of poetry books and scribbling of verses on napkins and paper scraps. This month will be, he will be 20, a grown man. He has already left his mother's house, already left parts of his childhood behind. But what should I take from the past through the door to the next of this next decade? I see myself as a writer, but does the world see me that way? Fingers on the keys, tap, 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 tap. He types out every combination of his name. Hen, Hen, Frederick A. Kittle, Fred A. Kittle, Frederick A. Wilson, A. Wilson, August Wilson. Yes, this one. This is who I am. So my friends, this book is quite long for a picture book. So I think what I may do is I may stop with these next two pages and finish this book on Monday, okay? So I'm gonna read these next two pages and then this is the second time I've had to do this with a picture book, but don't worry, we will finish the story of August Wilson. Poet of the Hill. Here he comes down center ave, white shirt, tweed coat, and fancy tie. Hey, August, where you get those clothes? Thrift shop, 50 cents. August walks on, relaxing into his day off from dish dishwashing at the diner, reciting lines from the collected poems of Dylan Thomas. When I was a windy boy in a bit and the black spit of the chapel fold, the stained paged dog-eared book tucked in his pocket, the author pictured with white shirt, tweed coat, fancy tie. At noon, he settles onto a stool at some eatery, Eddie's, Moose's, or the White Tower orders a large coffee and spends the rest of the day filling his legal pad with verses with verse lines and stanzas then spilling onto the back the backs of a stack of paper napkins people point whisper stare some hot soup or a sandwich before he wanders down to Pat's place the newsstand in the pool hall where he buys a cheap cigar and makes himself invisible, listening to stories of old railroad porters. Five ball in the side pocket. Hey, Nate, you still got your Pullman hat? Oh, yeah, somewhere Lucille got it up in the attic. I ought to look after it, I guess. A halo of smoke encircling his head. August attends, his mind like a magnet, grasping each word that is said. Finally, he rises, walks up Aaron Street to Wiley Avenue, meets a friend at Fish and Chips. They eat, the friends leave, but August hangs around outside, leans on a street sign and eavesdrops on, four, on the four men seated on milk crates and folding chairs inside the Jitney Station, joking, talking, arguing. Well, that's my business and nobody else's. Yeah, I know. But when you come in here like that, you make it my business. Come on now. He's just young. He's learning. To a fatherless son, this man talk is a gift. From the hills, tribal elders, warriors who survive in this hard world, and his job as a poet to keep them alive. All right, my friends, we will have to finish tomorrow this free Feed Your Mind, a story of August Wilson. And it certainly is a story. We will finish the rest of that on our marvelous Monday broadcast. Oof, what a story. All right, 
Next book, A Song for Gwendolyn Brooks by Alice Faye Duncan. Let's see if this looks the same underneath. Oh, it does. This dust jacket looks the same as the hardcover. Let's find out about Miss Gwendolyn Brooks. I sing a song for Gwendolyn Brooks. Sing it loud, a Chicago blues. Skip to the beat of elevated trains. They grumble, rumble, and roll real fast. The year is 1925. Gwendolyn Brooks is eight years old. Gray bursts of smoke hide the yellow sun. Can flowers grow without sunlight? Gwendolyn leans on the front yard gate. Gwendolyn is unsure. I, I sing a song for Gwendolyn Brooks. She greets each day in her velvety, in her velvet glory. Her head is filled with snappy rhymes. She writes her poems in dime store journals. Gwendolyn stands outside the fray. Her classmates cuss. They swish and sash, then sass. The busy clock. Clock, clock, tell the time. Tell the time to me. Magic, patient instrument. That is never free. Tick tock, busy clock. You've no time to play. Bustling men and women need you all the day. 1928. They joke and jive. They laugh real loud. They boast and bully. They signify. Girls jump rope on cracked sidewalks. Boys play baseball in the streets. Poets own, poets own a watchful eye. Gwendolyn stands alone. Sing a song for Gwendolyn Brooks. Her father is a janitor. He buys the food and pays the rent. Mothering is her mama's job. She cooks the food and scrubs the clothes. Baby brother is Gwen's best friend. They play checkers on rainy days. Fine looking family. When the sky is blue, Gwendolyn sits with her tattered notebooks. From the top step of her backyard porch, she watches and listens to the South Side neighbors. Women talk about men, men talk about sports, children call Gwen. Oh, stuck up heifer. Oh, 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 that is mean. She's not stuck up, she's deep in thought. Sing a song for Gwendolyn Brooks. Her mother believes, her father believes. But sometimes Gwendolyn doubts her radiance. When jarring, crashing, discordant words splotch and splatter her notebook pages, and when right words don't crystallize, Gwendolyn grabs her mother's garden trowel. She digs beneath the snowball bush and buries her poems in a backyard grave. Oh. Sing a song for Gwendolyn Brooks. She is a student at Forestville School. Miss School Teacher sends a letter home. It reads, Gwendolyn is a cheat. She plagiarized. Gwendolyn is a cheat. This is not so. Mama grabs her hat, black purse, and gloves. She march, marches Gwendolyn to the school. Mrs. Brooks defends her precious child. I know that's right. Isn't that something? Both of them were accused of plagiarizing. She says, Miss School Teacher, I must protest. Gwendolyn does not need to cheat. She writes and speaks with the finest ease. Test her now and we will see. 
Gwendolyn considers the insulting charge. She writes a poem in proud, prim letters. Forgive and forget. If others neglect you, forget. Do not sigh. For after all, they'll select you in times by and by. If their taunts cut and hurt you, they are sure to regret. And if in time they desert you, forgive and forget. Miss school teacher must drop her charge. Gwen steps high on her walk home. Gwen smiles brightly, Gwen believes. And as the sun breaks through gray clouds of smoke, sunlight shines on Gwendolyn's face. Sing a song for Gwendolyn Brooks, Chicago teams with black sharecroppers from Dixie Towns. While jobs are scarce in the Great Depression, migrants slog and scrounge for decent work. Gwen is sweet 16 and 33. She is, she is feathery voice and flickering flame. She gushes and giggles over Shakespeare's sonnets. Her parents are wise and see her light. They don't yell, go mop the floor. And when, in high, when high school chums must look for work, Gwendolyn is free to sit and think. Ambition. It hurts a lot to see the top and know you're at the base, to know some power holds you back and yet see glory's face. But all true climbers know that they must rise by base degree. And so they keep on climbing till they find that they are free. <laughs> she learns to labor for the love of words. Draft one is shoddy. Draft two is a thud. Gwendolyn toils to write one poem each day. She deletes, rewrites, then starts again. The simplest verse is a taxing struggle. Draft three is better, draft four is best. Her couplets waltz with wonderment. Gwen's confidence is a bud in spring. Revised, revisions make poetry ring. The Chicago Defender welcomes Gwen. Adults read her rhymes in the poetry section. Mr. Brooks proclaims to Mrs. Brooks, this girl we got is a gifted child. And one special day, Mrs. Brooks declares, she will be a poet, poet like Paul Dunbar. That's Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Sing a song for Gwendolyn Brooks, Chicago jazz bebop, hey. In a South Side Center where children play and borrow books, Gwen makes friends with Henry Blakely and 10 black poets. They analyze sonnets with a scrupulous ear. Under Inez Stark, their demanding teacher, they ponder Eliot, Stein, and Pound. Gwen savors her study of the modernist poets. After scribble, scratch, and sundry rewrites, alliterations leap from Gwendolyn's page. Her words are psalms from a south side street. They are polished and poised like English silver. Gwen shelters her poems in magazine, I'm sorry, Gwen enters her poems in magazine contests and again and again, she wins first place. The Children of the Poor, sonnet number two. What shall I give my children who are poor, who are adjudged and adjudged the least wise of the land? who are my sweetest leopards, who, lepers who demand no velvet and no velvety velour, but who are begged, who have begged me for a brisk contour, crying that they are quasi contraband. 
because unfinished, graven by a hand, less than angelic, admirable or sure, my hand is stuffed with mode design device, but I lack access to my proper stone and in plenitude of plan shall not suffice, nor grief nor love shall be enough alone to ratify my little halves who bear, uh, my little halves who bear across an autumn freezing everywhere. Sing a song for Gwendolyn Brooks. Time rocks and rolls a steady pitch. Gwen graduates college, Gwen marries Henry, Gwen mothers and poets in 1950. Henry works full time in a shirt and tie. He earns the bread for his wife and son. On East 63rd at Champlain, the family rents two rooms in a kitchenette building. Gwen's south side view is an urban suite. Pointed church steeples pierce the clouds. Pool room chaps skip school and smoke. Four and five families live in one house. Men walk and run, women sing and shout. 63rd Street is a brown faced muse. Gwen types her poems in a crowded corner. Click, clack, click, clack, she types. She deletes to type again, click, clack, Click, clack. Readers, readers crowd bookstores. They buy Gwen's books and she signs her name in fancy script. I can only imagine how exciting that was. Sing a song for Gwendolyn Brooks. She whistles her sonnets with perfect grace like Edna St. Vincent Millay and Robert Frost. With slinky sly and sea line spunk, Gwen swings the blues with her black pen like guitar players at Teresa's Lounge. Gwen paints poems with paintbrush words and Gwen takes home a Pulitzer Prize. A Pulitzer Prize? A Pulitzer Prize. Wow. Henry celebrates Gwen, junior too. They showered her with noisy kisses. Gwendolyn's parents cry tears of joy. They praise her shine. They saw it first. Mr. Brooks and Mrs. Brooks planted love and watered it. Gwendolyn believed she found her light. And a ferocious flower grew. Wow, the end. What an amazing story about Gwendolyn Brooks. I cannot wait to finish the one about August Wilson. Funny how they had the same issue with people thinking that because they were so amazing, they were plagiarizing. No, 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 absolutely not. Now, real fast, let's get to The Color of Us by Karen Cat. Ooh, you know what we gotta do. My name is Lena and I'm seven. I am the color of cinnamon. Mom says she could eat me up. <laughs> My mom's the color of French toast. She's an artist. Mom's teaching me how to mix colors. She says that if I mix red, yellow, black, and white paints in the right combination, I will have the right brown for a picture of me. The right brown? But mom, brown is brown, I say. That's not so, mom says. There are lots of different shades of brown. Let's take a walk. You'll see. <laughs> Hmm. 
We go to the playground where we see my friend Sonia. Sonia is a light yellow brown, mom says. Just like creamy peanut butter, I say. My favorite. Isabella is chocolate brown, like the cupcake we had for her birthday. Lucy has skin that's peachy and tan. My best friend, Jo Jin, lives close to the playground. Jo Jin is the color of honey. Two streets over, we meet my cousin Kyle. His skin is a reddish brown, like leaves in the fall. Carlos and Rosita have brought their new puppy to the park. Carlos is a light cocoa brown, and Rosita's skin looks like butterscotch. <laughs> we pass by the pizza parlor. Mom and I see Mr. Pellegrino flipping a pizza high in the air. He is the color of pizza crust, a golden brown. My babysitter, Candy, is like a beautiful jewel, bronze and amber. She looks like a princess. Mom and I walk to the park to eat our lunch. Look at everyone's legs, Mom. All the different shades. After lunch, we walk to mom's favorite store where Mr. Cashmere sells many different spices. He's the color of ginger and chili powder. Up the street is my Aunt Kathy's laundromat. Aunt Kathy is a tawny tan like coconuts and coffee toffee. After our walk, my friends come over. We take our towels to the roof and lie in the sun. I think about everyone I saw today. Sonia, Isabella, and Lucy, Jojen and Kyle, Carlos and Rosita, Mr. Pellegrino and Candy, Mr. Cashmere and Aunt Kathy, each one of them a beautiful color. My friends leave and I go downstairs. I'm happy as I get out my paints, yellow, red, black, and white. I think about all the wonderful colors I will make and I say their names out loud. Cinnamon, chocolate, and honey. Coffee, toffee, and butterscotch. They sound so delicious. <laughs> At last, my pictures are done and I've painted everyone. Look, mom, I say, the colors of us. <laughs> the end. Oh, wow, what a nice book. I love this book. I like that it talks about the different colors of different people and not just black people and not just white people, but people from different countries. I love that um, her mom, um, I'm sorry. Mina, that Lena, sorry, that Lena's mom took her out and said, you know, brown is not just brown. White is not just white. 
there are different colors all across the spectrum. And I like that um, Lena was encouraged to give each person's color a name. That no, it's not just brown, you're chocolate brown or your golden like pizza crust or your butterscotch brown or your peachy. I think that is so wonderful. And it's um, kind of representing and appreciating people's culture because even within African-Americans, there is such a range of colors. When you go to different countries, you go to India, there's a range of colors. Even amongst Caucasian people, there is a range of colors. So I love this book. I really do love this book. I think that this would be a good book, especially for African-American children, because sometimes they just think of our skin as dark and light. But this book right here can help especially melanated children think about their coloring and the coloring of other people differently. Not that one is above the other or that one is better than the other, but that we just appreciate all of the colors of us. Such a great book. Oh my goodness. These were great books today on this fabulous Friday. They were fabulous books on a fabulous Friday. Um, one thing I did not say, so the colors of us, let me do that real quick, is a square fish book. Um, sing a song for Gwendolyn Brooks is a Sterling Children's Books book and our um, book Feed Your Mind, a story of August Wilson that we will continue on our um, marvelous Monday. Okay. This one is, oh, hmm. it does not say, maybe it's in the back. Um, it is an Abrams Young Readers book. Okay. So, those were our fabulous books on this fabulous Friday. Before we end, let me remind you, okay, of our two chapter books that will be up for vote this today, tomorrow, Saturday, Sunday, until five o'clock on Monday. You get to pick the last one I picked. I think the last two I picked, but this time you are going to get to choose our new chapter book that will start on Monday. So our first choice is The Unteachables by Gordon Corman, The Unteachables. Our second choice is Patina, Patty Ain't No Junk, okay, by Jason Reynolds, okay? So these are the two books. These are our two choices. The Unteachables by Gordon Corman and Patina, Patty Ain't No Junk by Jason Reynolds. So please go on to the Facebook group and the Instagram page and vote on Periscope and Instagram, I mean on Periscope and YouTube. Leave something in the comments when you watch the replay, okay? Until next time, my friends, we are at the end of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. It is always a great and wonderful time to be with you all. Have a great weekend. Enjoy it. Have fun. You know, get outside in between the raindrops, depending on where you live. If you live someplace sunny, make sure you get outside and get some vitamin D on your skin. Breathe in some fresh air, maybe play in some grass, get to a beach, something, okay? Or if you just want to relax, just relax, okay? Well, that's all for me, folks. Until our marvelous Monday broadcast, 
I will see you next time right here on Miss Hope's Reading Hour on our Marvelous Monday. Until then.